This is the sixth panel, and um, we are gonna talk about um, Creative Machine and Heritage Common. What collaboration opportunity are there? And my name is Nisha Dotong. Um, I'm a, um, also from the artist collective Ilekeka um, that you heard from my partner uh, earlier, Geng Shagat. Um, and I'm an interdisciplinary Bangkok born um, Brooklyn based. Um, and I work with uh, technology and mostly uh, mainly um, related to visual. Um, and um, we have here um, our panel, um, uh, Sasha style. Uh, so, so Sasha is a poet, um, language artist, and AI uh, researcher whose work um, probe it mean to be human uh, in nearly post-human era. Um, a pioneer of algorithmic um, authorship and blockchain poetic, um, and author of hybrid poetry collection technology. Um, she became the first writer of AI power literature of major auction house and has been named one of the top artists shaping the digital art scene. Um, other honor include um, Future Art Award, the Women Pie shortlist, and um, nomination for Forward Prize, um, Pushcart Prize, and um, Best of the Net, um, also the co-founder of uh, Digital Poetic, po poetic um, Collective and uh, Words Force. Uh, she served as po uh, poetry mentor, mentor and um, humanoid um, android Bina 48 since uh, uh, 2018. Um, welcome. Um, and also we have um, Max Seals uh, Mid Journey. Uh, from Mid Journey, um, Max Seals is a general counsel of Mid Journey and operate open at adversary uh, service and a boutique uh, law firm that does general consoles um, service for AI company and artists. Um, before that, he lead a Google open source legal group. And lastly, we have uh, Sarwaj Mahajan um, from Krobo and Morning LLP. Um, he's a lawyer and a uh, with the law firm of Cobalt Morning, focusing on technology transaction among other things, he advised um, technology company on intellectual property and data rights and uh, responsibilities. Um, Salvage also has an um, undergraduate degree in South Asian Study and University of Pennsylvania. Um, and an interest in how South Asia cultural heritage is preserved, um, disseminate, and transform. So welcome all the panels. So I would love to start with um, how, also like how uh, you interact with um, um, AI in the, in the, your creatives are like um, the AI from the, the collaboration perspective in your in your day to day life and practice. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. And just first of all, thanks so much to everyone. The panels have been fascinating today. I've really learned a lot, and I'm leaving with a lot of food for thought. So thank you, Creative Commons, for organizing this. Um, so as Nisha said, and thank you again for that introduction. Um, I'm, I'm a writer um, as well as a language artist. So I am um, l mostly using generative text uh, tools, using large language models. Um, and for the most part, I'm using them as a co-author. I'm using them as a collaborator. Um, and uh, to give a specific example, I've actually written, um, I've written lots of poems now with AI. But I've uh, started in about 2018. Um, 
writing with uh, GPT-2, which now feels kind of ancient, but I started um, using sort of an off-the-shelf version of GPT-2 and quickly realized that it wasn't quite what I wanted um, in terms of its output, its voice. So I quickly um, you know, got over my intimidation as someone who comes from more of a language um, and linguistics background, and I kind of taught myself the, the basics of what I needed to know to start fine-tuning those underlying um, LLMs and basically started to take all of the poetry that I'd been writing you know, for years and years um, with the intent of publishing um, a more conventional book and used all that information, used all those poems, used all my associated research notes and all the things that had been sort of inspiring me and that I wanted to kind of reflect in my poetry. I turned that all into a training data set and used that to basically create a bespoke version of GPT-2 that really reflected um, my poetic style and my poetic concerns and was much better than the off-the-shelf model at writing the kinds of things that I felt were valuable. Um, so that's kind of, the, my, my main interest really is in using, uh, in using these tools in that fashion to kind of write with um, as a way of sort of thinking about how to expand my own practice as a writer um, and in terms of thinking through what it means um, you know, for the trajectory of literature. I'm someone who's been studying language um, my entire life, um, so I'm thinking kind of about what AI and what AI-powered literature um, means on the grand spectrum from you know, the oral tradition through the advent of written language and movable type. Now that we have generative text tools, um, in addition to lots of other technologies that are changing the way that we talk to each other and communicate, what does this really mean for how um, literature will look going forward, what it will do to us going forward, how we'll kind of create narratives, and how that will shape the way that we as humans move through the world. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking about it from all those different perspectives. So AI for me is a tool and a collaborator. It's also kind of a conceptual um, uh, cone almost, you know, um, to think about a lot of these larger questions and thinking about the relationship between language and technology um, much more broadly than, um, than the mechanical level. I'll leave it at that for now. Um, um, Max, do you have anything to, um, like what, what is, what about you? What, what is your day-to-day uh, -day and like what you interact with like creator with like the AI practice? Sure, um, first of all, thanks so much for, for having me. This has been an amazing, Two days of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so, I just don't even know where to start. Um, the I think I want to go to some of the copyright stuff that was talked about for a second, S specifically the idea expression dichotomy, which I don't think anyone brought up. You can't copyright protect facts. You shouldn't also be able to copyright someone's ideas. And Mid Journey, the that our goal, our mission, and the thing we still trying to do is enable people to think and think in new ways and then communicate those thoughts to each other. So it is still very surreal for me to see like how much people are focused on selling the images or tricking each other with the images. Like I think the the negative uses of the technology get a lot of press. But what people don't talk about is and which which I see every day is the way people are exchanging images and creating new aesthetics and new ways of expression like 100 times a week. There, there have been so many like new aesthetic movements within Mid Journey. Someone needs to go in and archive all that incredible like creative product. So I think the, the discussion is way, is way behind. Um, so one way I use it is it helps me think. Like, uh, I don't want to sell my images. It helps me interrogate my own thoughts and feelings. I'm not very good at drawing, so I put in some prompts and I play with it and I use it as a, as a reflection tool. Um, I'm also really interested in LLMs. So for our, for, for my legal practice, I've started simulating contracts. And I, because it's, people, people come and like they ask for, they, they want a contract, but they don't ever actually want that. What they want is like their entire relationship with the other person to be okay. And they want the whole, <laughs> thing figured out. And so I, I have these miscommunications like over and over again where people are like, can you please write this piece of paper and then everything will be okay. 
But it won't be okay if they don't trust the person they're doing business with. It won't be okay if they're afraid. So what I've been doing with LLM recently, and it's like really, uh, it's created for me, but you know, it's not like um, anything like you do. But I simulate for them, and we kind of do printouts of like the worst case scenarios, the best case scenarios. Um, and I, I think that's gonna happen a lot more frequently. I think the entire way people do business is gonna change. Mm -hmm. Um, what about you, Salish? From your experience, like, what is like to be to interact with like creator with AI or like yourself with AI? Uh, so I, I have to start with the uh, standard lawyer opening line. Anyone know what, what that's called? Disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> and the disclaimer usually is anything I'm about to say is going to be completely useless. So do keep that in mind. Um, but in this context, I think um, it, it, it is not that it's useless, but also an acknowledgement that we are at the beginning stages of something which I think most people will say is quite revolutionary. Uh, I think it's going to have a lot of societal impacts, whether you look at it from an intellectual property perspective, from, um, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of worry about uh, jobs and those kinds of things. So, you know, we're, 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 we're learning. And so from that perspective, I don't, I don't feel bad saying that, you know, what I'm about to say is useless. I'm here, uh, even though I'm sitting on this chair on this dais, I'm here as much a student to learn from people like Max and Sasha and Nietzsche and what they're doing and, and see what we can do with it. Um, there was um, one thing that Max mentioned, which I, I, I found was interesting and will also be my answer to the question of how do I use AI, and the answer is, at least as a professional, I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the reason is um, twofold. One is that's the guidance from um, our general counsel, and, um, and the reason is because a lot of the input information would actually reveal client confidential information. So do I actually implement an AI tool in my day-to-day -day practice? Uh, no, but I'm curious to know what it does. And one of the uh, curiosities that uh, I've touched on is contracts, which uh, Max mentioned. So I'm going to throw a question out to the audience, if I may. How many of you have used ChatGPT? I imagine pretty much everyone, right? Um, so do you all know that you actually have a contract with OpenAI? Uh, you've agreed to a set of terms which they consider an, um, a binding agreement, and likely most courts would uh, agree with them as well that uh, the, the types of information that you're revealing and so forth and the, your uses of their output are uh, pursuant to the terms that they've, that they've dictated. Uh, I looked at mid-Germany's terms of service and I said, I'm not going there. I'm just kidding, but they're, they're ver very well written. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the, the reason I raised this uh, uh, this point is we've spent, uh, the panels that I had an opportunity to um, hear are very much focused on copyright aspects and other legal aspects. Uh, there is an underpinning which um, of, of contract um, and that also is something that is worth uh, considering. Uh, and one just final thought on contracts is that I basically, that's what I do. I read, write, negotiate contracts. Sometimes I, I write some pretty mean terms of service too. Um, and contracts are really based on bargaining power. Um, it doesn't mean that they're right, but when you enter into a relationship, what you're looking at is, can I, can I you know, if, if I want to negotiate, I don't know if Max would even allow me, right? He would just say, look, you either want to use mid-journey service as it's defined and as the terms are, or you can leave. So I know that I don't really have a lot of uh, bargaining power there. In other cases, you may, but in any case, what, it, what I'm trying to get to is that as we contemplate gener generative AI particularly, but all the predecessor and sort of technology that's leading up to it, um, a lot of it is gonna be dictated based on who has the bargaining power. And I think that's something that we should, uh, we should be thinking about in these conversations as well. Um, really interesting. Um, that also touched on something that I, I would love to um, um, talk about, but also like 
wanted to come back to um, Sasha what you just mentioning um, before also Max you touched on it a little bit on like um, how the AI to um, inform your practice or like inform what you are thinking like how that process of like feedback loop or like that enhance or shift the way you thinking and what is missing from that process um, well I, I thought something that Max said really resonated with me and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about too which is that when we're using these tools it's not just to um, you know, create something specific, it's to actually think through and kind of unlock or artic articulate something that we might not otherwise be able to say or to see uh, or to draw or to paint. And even though these tools are called generative tools, it's not just about, you know, generating an output. So, you know, I've, I've been over the past, you know, two days, been hearing the word interrogate a lot. And that is another word that I'm finding incredibly interesting as part of this discussion. I use these tools quite a lot to probe and to interrogate and to sort of help kind of turbocharge my own research or to sort of speed read through things and kind of make links and associations that you know poets and writers have been making for time immemorial, but I'm able to do it now at speed and scale that you know wasn't possible for someone like T.S. Eliot, for example. So, you know, I think that's a big part of it too, is that these tools are not just about making, they're also very well said, like they are about thinking and they're about sort of um, enabling us to make connections between data points in a way that we as individual humans with our analog you know, minds are simply not equipped to do. And I think for me, um, being able to approach AI that way is really revelatory and dials down a lot of the fear factor, you know, in some ways, of course, but um, I tend to think about it really as, um, you know, I, there's the term artificial intelligence I know is, is kind of like a strange and troubling term, and I tend to think about it as augmented imagination or amalgamated imagination. And for me, it's really a way of sort of combining the questions and the curiosity and the wonder, the ideas that I already have, and then kind of strapping on a prosthetic imagination and being able to sort of rifle through, you know, a history's worth of information that's right at my fingertips. Being able to um, dip into the entire library of Alexandria without having to have actually read any single one of those books. Uh, and I think, you know, again, for me as a poet, it's made me think quite a lot about all the ways in which I'm consciously quoting or referring or alluding to other creative sources. And then all the things that are just kind of innately part of the cultural canon that I've absorbed, you know, just as a human being that I've learned over time. Uh, and so thinking a lot about, you know, my role as a writer, as someone who's supposed to be originating language, thinking about how that um, fits into this larger question, I think has, um, has, been, has been a very sort of revelatory way for me to um, approach this. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I really appreciate that way of framing it. Yeah, I think like you said yesterday, Language is a tool, or uh, language is a technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's crazy how, the difference. Sometimes I just feel like my thoughts are everywhere. I can't focus them. Then you open a notebook and you start writing. And then all of a sudden, I didn't know I felt like that. I didn't know that my thoughts were organized like that. And I, it, there's definitely this extra, um, there's ex extra power of ideation that you can do. Uh, but one, one thing that's, that I've been thinking a lot as I see all these artists on mid-journey making new things. And again, like the contrast between that and I think the caricature of appropriating existing work and then just trying to duplicate it, which I don't know where this idea comes from because it's not, it's not what people are actually doing. I think we're probably projecting our fears on it. But I think um, a, a positive of that is that the same old human evils are at work here, so you don't have to be afraid of AI. Just be afraid of human beings. Like, <laughs> <laughs> expropriating other people's cultural heritage, like that, that's a human thing. Disparate bargaining power and using that in unethical ways, that's human behavior. Mm. This is, a, it's all just human behavior. Maybe it could happen a little faster, but really AI is more of like a, a blanket that people use to cover themselves up. Like, it's not gonna materially change people acting as
Um, so like with that um, collaborative process and the pattern that emerge, um, do you think like um, um, these two, how these two can do better in terms of, um, you know, like, I, so, sorry, I'm going to step back a little bit. Um, it's really interesting when you talking like about like the terminology like um, machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence because like because like um, to me like um, artificial intelligence is kind of like distance and make it intelligence and kind of like alien in a way but uh, machine learning is really straightforward and like what it like what the algorithm like really do like you training you making model and then training like it learning from from you so it have like that collaborative aspect um and like what you uh, touch on it like definitely like there is a, a lot of like the system that we already have in hand like the the boundary of like the languages or like the boundary of like the uh, the power structure that we already have that definitely like adapt on these like ai tools like um, so I was wondering in terms of like um, how how we do better in terms of like um, shift like make the shift in a way that is like it's a creative effort to to make a, like a better um, better creative world or like better world yeah. That's all you. <laughs> all right. Uh, like I said, anything I say is not going to be. I'll, I'll give the, uh, the question a, sh a shot, maybe just to get some uh, discussion going. I think it would be, it, the idea would be to address some of the evils that have uh, seeped into society. So if uh, AI is going to you know, be used or become a prevalent uh, technology in, in the world that we live in, is are there ways, mechanisms, through laws, through contracts, through other, uh, norms, uh, other ways of um, maybe balancing the bargaining power, to use that uh, example, um, reduce, ex maybe reduce exploitation to, um, you know, uh, not, if not to have AI sort of as a replacement for hum human uh, labor and effort and income, but to, to augment it and, and enhance it. So I think that's sort of, uh, I, I'm saying this not as a lawyer or anything that I practice, but just some of the things, you know, when I'm uh, sitting sleepless at night and wondering if there's gonna be a, a AI generator that can, uh, you know, write all my contracts for me. Um, you know, these are the things that I think about. We're all looking for, we've always, I mean, I think it's, it's sort of the perpetual uh, effort or endeavor of humankind to find better ways to live and do things. So go back, so because we so we're th we think about law, we, we do law, but I still don't know what the answer is. I was hoping that we could talk about it together and you could help me think of the answer. I still don't know what kind of society we want to see in terms of what system of laws or incentives maximizes creativity. So I, I think con if you look at our constitution, that's the whole reason we have all these IP laws supposed to advance science, it's supposed to advance creativity. Um, that's why the government lets people enclose their own work, not because it's theirs and they did it and their effort like inherently entitles them to that. It's because the idea is if you let someone say that something's theirs for a limited period of time, theoretically that's supposed to incentivize them to be really creative. But I've been thinking through this, I don't know what the answer is, but if we all agreed that we want to see a society where the maximum amount of people are being created, I, I, I don't know, my brain stops there. Like, what, what does the commons look like in that, in that world? Yeah, well, okay, so I guess jumping off that um, and taking it maybe in a slightly different direction, but I mean, I, something that I've been thinking about a lot just in general and then of course today 
is just the scale and scope of the challenges and just this task at hand when we think about the underlying models that are at the heart of all these discussions that we've been having they are staggeringly large and the idea of, of creating those and kind of retroactively making them good and better is almost an insurmountable challenge in some way and I guess like what I think about and I relate this to like the work that I've been doing with um, you know with my writing as I mentioned before, like I'm working in a way that's very collaborative where I'm actually fine tuning and creating bespoke and custom generators and things like that. To me, I'm sort of thinking about the fact that the way that we're thinking about AI right now is as this massive, massive, almost like too big to understand entity. Um, and for me, what's really been helpful is kind of letting those models in a way be the stuff that is everywhere out there that like is just around us all the time. And then to make it useful for me as a, as a creative person, but to make it useful for anyone, I think maybe there needs to be another level on top of that, which is you know your personal point of view, your style, your information, your references, your personal history, your experiences. And putting those two things together is a way of sort of saying, yes, all the information that's out there in the world is full of very troubling things, and there, that's always going to be the case. And then, you know, that is, that is there. It is shaping the world the way that we know it. And then there is this ability to, you know, to use technology to, to create something, to create a version of that that's more uh, individual and intimate, and that enables you to kind of engage with these tools on a very different level. And to maybe concretize that a little bit, it's like, I think about you know when when the computer was invented, the computers that existed were these massive room-sized pieces of hardware um, that you had to go you know use at an institution or something. No one had access to these tools on their own. And then the rise of personal computing came, and everybody had access to these tools. And now you know we can see how that's changed everything. So to me, I'm thinking, you know, maybe one piece of this um, that is valuable to think more about is how do we create more of a personal AI? How do we create small data sets? How do we focus on, um, you know, taking, taking what's large and using the best of it, but then applying it with something that is more meaningful to us on an individual basis? So I think personal AI to me is like something that feels like it is a valuable um, way of potentially like moving the conversation in a slightly more fruitful direction. Um, really um, interesting. Um, uh, and I wondering, Sasha, like on that note, like when you're working with like the personal data, is there anything that um, you feel like it cannot be um, contained in those like the tool that how it shaped? For example, um, I'm speaking in also Thai, and uh, many of the model and and many terminology is like in English, and with the translation, there is a like shift in the meaning and uh, shift in what it contain actually. So like with with that idea, like is there anything that left out um, that that if you were not like using AI? And versus like the version of like your AI alter ego, let's say, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Well, so just to I guess to like put that to embed that in yeah. a in a concrete, um, well, two concrete examples. So you mentioned before that I've been working with um, Bina Forty Eight um, yeah. for a while now. So Bina Forty Eight is this um, this human humanoid AI powered robot built by Hanson Robotics. Um, it was built I think around twenty uh, ten. Um, and is a cousin of Sophia Robot, who's like the much more famous one to come out of Hanson. But, um, but Bina 48 is really interesting because um, this whole project is basically an experiment in digital immortality and in how you can use um, information about yourself to sort of create a repository of data that will enable someone in the future, say, to, in to interact with this mind file as though it was you and learn something about you. And it, so it's basically a question of saying how, how much and how much about yourself do you need to sort of um, download and in what format do you do that and then how do you train it and how do you sort of shape it so that it becomes um, sort of a useful representation of you. And so that being able to work on that project has made me realize the, you know, the gap between what's readily available, of course out there um, you know, on the internet and all that and then your own personal history and of course, there's all the things that we put out there in terms of social media and the things that we're you know, sharing um, 
when we post in all these different places or agree to these terms of service and whatnot. But then there's also lots of other things that are sort of just, you know, they, we take them for granted or they're embedded in our physicality and they don't actually translate to data in some way. Yeah. So thinking through a lot of those things has been, um, has been very top of mind for me and thinking through like all the sort of haptic information that doesn't get captured yeah. in, um, for example, in LLMs or, you know, other, other underlying technologies. And that's something that I'm very keen to think more about as a poet is how much of, you know, what, um, what shapes the experience of something like poetry, for example, is not just the text itself, but how much of it is also, you know, spoken word, or how much of it is aesthetic and seeing something on a page in a certain way, um, you know, and that relates to, you know, potentially the rise of things like, um, you know, from from text to image models. Now looking at things like um, facial recognition to image, and like looking at how a model may be able to scan your face and catch an emotion that you don't even maybe know is there and yeah. turn that into an image. So thinking about, um, yeah, I guess the language lists part of information that might be useful to get at some of, some of these areas that are missing. But it, really quickly, the other thing that's more of a concrete um, example is that uh, one of the reasons I'm very interested in, um, in small data and in building my own data sets is because um, there's certain parts of my own family history that I know are just not really readily available anywhere. My, my mother is from a, a tribe of Mongolians called the Kalmyks, and it's a very small tribe. There's only like 3,000 uh, Kalmyks in the U.S., and it's a dying language that is not really represented very much online or in any you know archival repositories. There's a lot that's oral tradition um, that has not been you know concretized anywhere, not inscribed anywhere. So I'm also very interested to think about how histories like that yeah. can be downloaded and preserved and the right way to do that so that they're accurately representing the orality or the physicality of the tradition. Um, so yeah, that's, yes, it's that's a great question. Thank you. Um, um, so I think we at time, but um, I wanted to ask if anyone have a um, question, wants to open a question from audience. Um, hi, I, my question is, do you think there's a point uh, in which the cost of not using generative AI will outweigh the legal or moral precedent? So like, maybe this is an extreme hypothetical, but say a law firm uh, decides to uh, allow the use of ChatGPT um, in their line of work, and as a result benefits from that expediency and efficiency and that sets the precedence for the rest of the law firms who can't keep up. So in your respective lines of work, do you ever think that point could exist? I think we're probably already at that point. Um, the demand, at least as a lawyer, to be more efficient has always been there, and particularly um, may be known to many of you that law firms traditionally have valued their advice based on the num amount of time required to produce it. And now all these technologies are really shrinking that amount of time. So I, I, I think we're there, uh, at least in, in the private sector, we're all trying to figure out how, how do we do it as quickly as possible while maintaining the integ you know, our ethical obligations to protect client confidentiality. Um, I don't know if that's a complete or direct answer to your question, but I, I, I do think that uh, any uh, profession that needs to produce sort of written content or, you know, is, is, is always under pressure to do it in a more efficient way. So other types of professional services, accounting work, um, consulting work, there's, there's a, a lot of pressure right now to, to figure out how to do it, but how to do it correctly. No, I don't, I don't think, un unless, look, unless the bar comes out and says that, you know what, forget this uh, attorney client privilege stuff, but no, we're, we're not gonna, you know, put ourselves at risk. Uh, for that, but I, I, I think the demand is definitely there and we're maybe even stalling <laughs> to meet that demand by using the, the, the excuse of, well, I, I can't share my client's information with this tool. Would that not be solved then
released a, a version of ChatGPT for business where the you know there's going to be different terms that are going to govern you know how that's used differently. Maybe uh, other companies are thinking of, of, of the same thing. So there's multiple ways of of dealing with that. Um, the original question was, have we reached a tipping point? And I think we have. Max, as a lawyer, may have uh, views as well, or any. Uh, first off, thank you guys all for the panel. Uh, you know, Sasha, to kind of riff on what you talked about in terms of, you know, your heritage and, you know, the language and thinking about how AI not only can be used to create language, um, but also thinking about how AI can be used to preserve language, right? And if we think about um, the power dynamics of the race to who has the best algorithm, right? And we're seeing, you know, Microsoft entering the fray with their investment of open AI, right? We're seeing Google create one, Meta's creating one, Midjourney, we have all these companies that are racing to it and it becomes a power dynamic of who has the most money to make the resources, to get the resources to be able to generate. How do we worry or think about preservation of like the common, of the heritages, right? With like language as one example, like who, how do we think about the right methods by which we go about doing those preservations? Like who's gonna be in charge of it? Is it people at Meta? Is it people at Midjourney? Or are they like hiring people? Like, it's a... Is it? Yeah, I, I can, I, it's, a, it's a great question. I think one cool thing about generative AI is, um, I think in a lot of ways, business and economics have become dramatically simplified. So it's just about chips now. So are there enough GPUs to do all this stuff? And so it could be as simple as the government or nonprofits just get an allocation or somehow secure an allocation of chips to do inference. So I really think it's important to not depend on big companies to do beneficial things for the community. It's, it's great when they do, um, but I think ethics washing is a, is a huge concern and if people want to take, I, I think it's probably on the responsibility of those communities and the government to uh, take charge of that. I don't think people should depend on big companies. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with that. I would, I would say also, and, and um, add to that, that something that I think is really interesting that doesn't maybe take precedent in the conversation as often as it should, like people kind of think about, um, you know, scraping data and then like everything is about that data and like how companies are managing, managing it or not. Um, and there's actually a lot of creation of new data that's happening, like specifically to go into these systems. And they're actually, you know, okay, I'll give you, again, you know, my experience as a poet is that usually there's not very many ways to make a living as a poet, but actually a lot of these companies are starting to hire poets and short story writers and academics and, you know, other other writers who normally don't really have that kind of a livelihood. They're, they're hiring these people to come in and like write, you know, write creative um, samples, um, you know, write all sorts of texts that, can, that they can then bring in without a lot of the legal the legalities and the you know the concerns we've been talking about today. So they're creating original text as um, as samples, and so you know maybe there's opportunities in thinking about those kinds of new roles that are being created for these kinds of transmissions um, to happen. And I mean I'm very realistic about these technologies in general. I don't I try not to be like Pollyanna-ish about them, but I also realize that we kind of create what we envision and what we think about. So I try to be very optimistic that um, a lot of the tech companies kind of like realize all the scrutiny that they're under. And there are a lot of good people working, you know, at the level of hiring these people to come in and create data or hiring um, artists like me to come in and sort of use the tools and like respond and give feedback and all that. So I, I also kind of, you know, I look at my sort of strange experience of being an interloper in the tech world as being a perfect example of how things like this can start to at least become a conversation. Bringing perspectives that wouldn't normally be at those tables is really important. And that's another reason why I, as a poet, am like very 
find it very strange to be sometimes on panels with lawyers and with tech companies, but I'm doing it because I think it's important, especially for um, tools that involve language at such a deeply embedded level. It's important for people that use language, like all sorts of writers, to engage with them and give feedback and you know imagine and ideate um, ways for them to become better and more useful tools. Um, thank you for the lovely perspective and um, hopefully we move forward um, with like these uh, AI with care. So thank you so much. <laughs>